What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today we have an incredible guest, Phil Hellmuth, arguably the best poker player in the world, arguably the best poker player of all time, a true legend when it comes to the game, but he's so much more than that. I mean, of course, we do talk about everything that he's done on the table, all the tens of millions of dollars that he's made from poker winnings, but... He has a lot to say about investments, how he turned that money into more money, how he's friends with most of the most powerful and influential people in the world. And I'm serious. I mean, he has stories about Elon, Michael Jordan, Drake, Jay-Z. It's 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 the most extensive interview we have ever done on this podcast. So with that said, I really want to get right to it. There's there's so much to unpack. We got to go. A quick message from our partners at Oracle NetSuite, and then we will be right back. Buckle up for this one. 2000, 2008, even 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you got the dot com crash and the housing crash and the roller coaster that we're going through right now. One thing is certain it is a dangerous time to not know your numbers, but over 31,000 businesses don't really have that problem. Instead, they have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, everything you need to manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve those margins. So when there's uncertain times, remember the answer is NetSuite. You can identify rising costs, automate business processes, easily see where to save money. And that's why 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgrade it to NetSuite. So what are you waiting for? Right now, you're in luck because NetSuite is offering a special one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you have to do is head to NetSuite.com slash my other passion. Once again, NetSuite.com slash my other passion. I promise you, it will take your business to the next level. Phil, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I'm definitely really happy to have you here, too. What is uh, what's going on in your life right now? I mean, so much happens in my life. It's crazy. You know, I mean, like uh, last night, it was really nice that Lex uh, Friedman. I don't know if I pronounced the name right. And I apologize, Lex. Uh, I had dinner with him and he came to my home or my home game. And uh, what an incredible guy. You know, he's going to be interviewing Zelensky. He's going to be doing Kanye West this weekend in L.A. And uh, just really hit it off with him well. I'm sure I'll do his podcast. You know, he does like six, eight hour conversations. (laughs) I didn't know this. Um, But just really enjoyed him. I I love, I love, um, you know, those type of convos. And, you know, I try try to go along on this show, honestly, when we can, because it really takes a minute to like warm up and get to know somebody. So definitely know where he's coming from didn't you when we were talking before this didn't you mention like he's gonna talk to elon too yeah you know i mean um he he had talked to elon earlier in the day about uh and you know i've hung out with elon quite a bit i went to ai day uh here in palo alto last week you know and and got five minutes with elon um but you know he had his kids there so he was a little busy um you know i've been to i've been with elon and he came to my book launch party and we've you know, well, tell me about what's he up, wants what's to up a party out of the country. And talk I to us about that. Elon, bro. Tell us, tell us some Elon stories. What's uh, what's it like hanging out with that guy in real life? I mean, we uh, we had we had this thing that that's okay to talk about. Um, we were in Italy, and uh, and uh, and we were there with a couple of friends. It's just a crazy fun event somebody's 50th birthday party can't mention the name a lot of guys don't want their names mentioned and so i'll keep them out of, of it but we're just having fun and uh i'm walking along the table and uh, it's a long table like 20 people on each side and uh and i start talking to uh a friend of mine across the way he's like hey you want to play heads up tonight well i know i can't play heads up because my friends part of their 50th birthday party he wanted to play six hours of poker every day and so we took this you know, Global Express straight to Italy. We took helicopters to the resorts, one of the best resorts, you know, in the world. And I never left the campus. I might even make it to the golf course, but it's just, it was just so beautiful. Uh, you know, one of the Ferragamo son uh, came up to me, big fan of mine. And uh, now I'm going to help him. I think he's at Columbia. 
and uh, he wants me to, to, you know, but we just hit it off well, but just this crazy fun, you know, kind of, and, and you know, he says, well, to me, without, hey, well, I was about to say, I was like, well, what, what is, what does he say to you? You know, like what's one gym, you know, he might've dropped on you that you're like, all right, you know, that was a cool convo with like the richest guy in the world. It's watching him. Yeah. It's watching him kind of like lead is fun, but he's like, Hey, Phil, we should, you should play my friend for, you know, uh, a million Dogecoin at the time. Dogecoin was 225,000. I'm like, this is amazing. The whole table lights up. This is going to get this done. And my friends are like, ah, and then I'm like, and I go back to E and I'm like, Hey, you know, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should live stream this. It's kind of a private birthday party. And as some handlers are all like, no, no, no. And he's like, Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> My friends wouldn't let me play the match. Uh, they didn't want the spotlight, you know. But I thought it would have been fun just because, you know, just for E to get in there and have a little fun, you know. I mean, because to him, that's just such a small bet. And, uh, and you know, I, I think he would have uh, he would have enjoyed. He would have. He wasn't playing. His friend was. So he would have sat behind and showed him the cards. And it was just a pretty cool scenario. Um, he also asked me for, you know, lessons that trip poker lessons and uh, but he's a busy guy um yeah i can imagine you think doge is going back up at any point and i ask because i'm holding maybe maybe elon has something in the tuck that he's about to drop on us but <laughs> dog, that whole 2021 yeah. bubble i don't know maybe it was a bubble like what what's your opinion i don't know if you're a crypto guy you know the my, my doge wallet um, yes. that, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good project. I, I believe in, I believe in it because, you know, Elon believes in it. He started letting people buy Teslas with Dogecoin. So I don't own any Dogecoin. I have some investments in that area though. I, I I'm betting, I, I bet a lot of money on Dogecoin is what happened. So we'll see what happens, but through some investments, um, I mean, these guys changed the world, you know, I mean, you know, Elon and, and, you know, what does Lex do? Well, he has some of the world's best podcasts, but he's also an AI guy. And, uh, you know, maybe he can make some Twitter bots, you know, to kind of clean up Twitter. I love Twitter. And uh, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's been well, a really I love fun. hearing, I love hearing about I love hearing about it, man. I, I know for, you know, everyone listening, I think we probably got some poker fans, people who are, are, are familiar with your work. Um, but you are one of the greatest poker players of all time. You have made tens of millions of dollars from poker. I love your story because I feel like we have some Midwest kinship. You grew up in Madison, right? Yeah. Okay. And you went to Madison, you know, UW Madison. So I grew up in Chicago area. I went to Illinois down in Champaign. You know what that is. Big 10. Absolutely. All your friends. I'm going to Indiana for parties. I got Wisconsin friends coming down. You know the whole thing. But what was yeah. crazy to me is I knew a friend, and I don't think he quite turned into the type of player that you are, but I had a friend who dropped out to play poker, and I would go over to his place. We'd have some business finance do, and and this dude would have, like, eight computers running, you know what I mean? And at a point, <laughs> at a point, he was just like, you know, I'm making, like, a few hundred grand here. I'm, like, 20 years old. I'm quitting. And what was that turning point for you, like for, for people who aren't totally familiar with your experience, this is like the late eighties, right? You, you mid eighties, mid, you know, in the eighties, you decide yeah. I'm pursuing this thing full time. And you know what? Like the front office sports audience is a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people who take risks. And a lot of them listen to this podcast to sort of understand the, 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 get inside the mind of other people who have done that and done it as successfully as yourself. So how did you make that decision? Yeah, it was a good decision. And by the way, uh, I'm on, what have I advised? 17 companies. I'm actively advising 10 companies. So that's a fun, that's really fun for me because I can help the young entrepreneurs and open up my network, right? You know, on, you're going to um, get all into that too. Um, but yeah, the yeah TikTok, just... TikTok calls me the billionaire wrangler. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, but to come back to, to come back to your point uh, about, you know, making that transition, I was in college. And I had some student loans and, um, and I started playing poker and the next thing you know, I had $20,000 in the bank and there was a very key moment in my life 
I, I'd like to say, I see the light kind of a weird, you know, 1987 and, uh, you know, spring and, you know, there's, you're a Midwestern guy, there's snow on the ground, but it's starting to melt. You know what I mean? It's one of those of kind of like overcast days that we have in the Midwest and there's snow on the ground and it's in between winter and summer. I don't like those days as much, but anyway, um, I decide to, to, you know, go play poker, but I have 20,000 in the bank and I'm going to go play in a game where I can make three or 400 max. So I get bored quickly, but I want to go to the golf course, but there's still snow on the ground. And so my friends and I are like, all right, it's like 3 PM. I'm going to go to the bar with them. So I have a drink and I've never been a day drinker and I smoke pot and, uh, you know, um, and so, and I, I don't smoke a lot of pot. And I'm not anti-pot. I mean, I was at a friend's wedding and he had a pot bar. <laughs> I've been seeing those lately. But we're in California, you know. Yeah, it's legal. It's a, I don't, it's a, new, anyway, it's a new day in America. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, there I am in this bar, dingy place, right? And it's overcast and, you know, and I'm playing pool for $20 a game. And like that song almost popped into my head. Many days go by, water flowing underground. Same as it yes. ever was. Same as it ever was. And I, I kind of like when I wrote my autobiography. There's water at the bottom of the ocean. Under the water. Like, I'm, you're about to get me doing the whole David Byrne. Like, keep going. Like, keep going. I want to oh hear if you, how, how far can you go? And you may ask yourself, how do I work this? Where is that beautiful? <laughs> like, I could, do, I could do the whole thing. Me and you could get into keep like going, talking. Keep going. Another verse or two. Bro, don't get me started. I get on this pod and every episode I'm getting, I'm diverging to talk about music for like too much of the episode. Um, also, when my love stands next to your love. Like, dog, Talking Heads, that's, that's the, that's the gem for real. They brought, they brought some real art house energy to that new wave punk scene. Yeah. In fact, I always, talk when i when i get up with cats like you who are really there when new order was hitting when joy division was hitting, when talk talking has was said i oh you know i went back and studied all that but i'm always like damn what was it like when that depeche mode when that damn strange love dropped in 87 for the first time and you know i was there seems- i love depeche mode i went to see him back in the 80s uh, I knew I knew it. As soon as you started quoting talking, I'm like, ah, oh, this dude was there. <laughs> so <laughs> so um so yeah, back to your story though. You're you So there I am in a like, dingy bar, mm-hmm. right? And all of a sudden I'm like, you know, this this you know, the song didn't necessarily kick in, but I'm like, what the f are you doing with your life? This is ridiculous. And I called a taxi, wasn't gonna drive, and uh I was just what a waste of of a life. I was thinking, and I open the door. Boom! The sun is is hitting. So imagine now there's a road, kind of a busy road with a lot of traffic, and uh, and the sun is kind of melting the snow. So I'm hit from this dingy dark bar. Maybe now at five p.m. with this, bam! This light, just boom! It's like it was like the light, very symbolic of what I was going to do the next few hours and I go home, but I mean, and I just, I start writing and, uh, you know, and writing and writing and, you know, I invented all these concepts right then and there. One was I wrote down my long-term goals. I'm going to become the best poker player in the world because, and then I came up with this other concept right then and there of a pyramid. So there's two pyramids. The first pyramid is, poker. Now what happens is people play at the lower levels, like your friend, and maybe he was on the second or third level, but imagine a pyramid. So people, you know, the home games, the bar games, the people Mm -hmm. that win that, they take it to the next level and the next level and the next level. And some make it and some drop back down, but the money stays and the money keeps going up. So you get to the top of the pyramid. That's where you're going to make all your money in poker. If you're not one of the greatest, you're never going to become you know, really wealthy. So I decided, all right, I'm going to become the greatest poker player of all time. Okay. Here's this pyramid. I wrote that concept. Then I wrote another pyramid of, you know, of basically the bottom layer is okay. These are things you have to get rid of within the same period of of things I want to master. So, all right, let's not become a compulsive gambler. Uh, Let's not be a drug guy. Let's not, you know, become an alcoholic. 
all right, and then get to the next level. Exercise is going to be very helpful. Sleep is going to be very helpful. Get to the top level. It's all about money management, MM. Manage your money because that is key, and we can talk about that now or later, but uh, maybe a quick note on the money management. No, let's get into it. Uh, tell me because the first well, thing I'm sitting here story. thinking. So I write okay. all this stuff out, and then it turns into this book later called Positivity, Eight Life Tips. Um, and Tony Robbins loves my book. He's on the back. He gave me a jacket. Blurb. So did Cheryl Sandberg. Now, we're on a business podcast. Everybody knows who Cheryl is. Cheryl and I of were at the course. Aria recently having a drink. And she's like, nobody knows me in Vegas. <laughs> but if I'm in New York, everybody knows me. And everybody was, I said, yeah, everybody knows me in Vegas. And we were just laughing. Cheryl's great. And, uh, but she gave me a jacket. She loved it. She gave me a super enthusiastic jacket. But I also put Draymond Green on here. Um, I have four nice. seats for the Warriors tonight with my friend Joe Lacob and Nicole. I'll ride up with them. Man, all I'm doing is bragging. But this book. No, tell I me about your life. I love it. Tony Robbins, Eight Life Tips. When Tony, I found out Tony Robbins tells people to buy my book in his advanced seminar. I about like went crazy for two weeks. My head was just spinning. Because, you know, I, I, at the basic essence, I'm a poker player. And I know I've crossed all these borders, you know. Um, but it's still really cool to write Eight Life Tips, which helped me get to the top. And... Mm-hmm. And so from that one night, all right, this is the transition. This is the path you're going to be on. In 1989, I then won the main event. 750000 I predicted I'd win it. And, uh, you know, you multiply that times 10, I guess. So it's like $7.5 in today's dollars. And uh, pretty cool. Uh, you know, um, there's a lot of conflict with my family. And I'll let you choose the direction we can talk about. The issues I had with my dad that are interesting, or we can talk about money management, where you want to go. So I'm imagining that you could probably wrap this all up together because I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, wow, you turn the corner, you make all this money. What was it like to make your first million, make your first few million and, and understand, okay, wow, I have transcended. And of course, you probably, things happen every decade you look and you're in a new place. But what's it like when you're like, okay, I'm a millionaire off poker now. How are you managing your money? And what conflicts did this create with your family? Yeah, you know, I play poker with a bunch of billionaires. And so the one thing I can tell them is, you know, if they ever tease me, because I'm not a billionaire. And I'll be like, I'll be like, fellas, or actually I'll swear like, motherfuckers, I was rich way before you were. And that's the only thing I've got on them because, you know, a lot of them became billionaires in 2010-ish. And, uh, you know, so that's all I have is, is I had a lot of money back in 1989, but it wasn't a smooth ride at all, Ernest. Uh, you know, you really had to, to manage your money well. By then I had, you know, by 1994, I had two children. I'm still married uh, to the same woman, Kathy. Um, and uh, we, she doesn't want her last name mentioned. She doesn't wear, want where she works, but she's at a major university here and has moved way, way up in her profession as a doctor. That's about all she wants said about her. Um, but this this money management thing um, is a very difficult thing, you know, and and for a, from some years there, there were a couple of years there where I kind of felt like I was paying month to month. And yet yet I was worth a million. So I had this house paid for. And even in, you know, the 19, 1990s, uh, this place was worth a million. But. And I didn't have a mortgage, but I'd still be like, all right, what do we have? 10,000 bills do. And so, you know, it, it wasn't a smooth, easy ride uh, all the way up. And I had to learn how to play all the games and I had to learn how to discipline and control myself. And, and, you know, I had this, I'm a fantastic player, an amazing player. I mean, when I come to Vegas fresh the first two days, so I'd play a day, then I'd play another day and then it would come to the second night. And then rather than just be up 30,000 and be happy, I'd hop in that game at 11 p.m. Oh, maybe one more bite of the apple. What are you doing? You know, you just played 10 hours and 10 hours. You want to hop in now by three in the morning. I'm 25,000 loser. I'm only a 5K for the trip. And so, you know, learning to play when you're not tired, learning to play in good lineups, learning the discipline to keep playing your style at all times. That took me decades, 
you know, to, to basically master it all. And um, you have to be careful. If you say you master it all, you might just fall. So when I, so I should, so I, I basically have made a lot of money every year for a long time. And then, you know, about two, 1999, I'm like, you know, I want to be with my wife and kids. So I'm going to start doing more business stuff. And I started transitioning to business. And then, you know, I came on uh, as a, an advisor for a company, then another company. And then that young founder, Lasso Socks. I came mm -hmm. for Partha Unava. Now, those socks, James Harden wears them for every basketball game. They're the best compression socks ever made. They're the only FDA approved medical device. So he's like, I want you to advise. And then he brought me seven other young founders to advise. And, you know, and so this kind of, there's this transition to business, but, but I, but, but I always knew Ernest, my goal was to become the greatest poker player of all time, the goat. And I think I'm that in tournaments right now. It's hard for anybody to say otherwise. But you have a lot of people out there that are segmenting it. Oh, well, there's eight different fields and Phil's not the best in this and this and this and this. They want to, they want to make sure they point that out. I have some haters. And everybody does when they start the, winning. It's hard to enjoy the 99% of the people that say you're, you know, the all time great or whatever. Because that 1%, one percent, that one bad comment you're like focusing on, right? And so having that self doubt, even if you break out of it 10 minutes later, hour later, it's like, that stuff can sting sometimes, no matter how much you've accomplished. But how did you manage your money? How did you actually handle suddenly being a multimillionaire? Um, and you, money management is like one of your core things that, you know, it's on your pyramid. So like, how do you actually do it? Like, like, did you say, let me save, let me invest in the S&P 500. Let me invest in companies. Like, what did you do? I did one really smart thing, because if you look at the statistics, you'll discover that, you know, the average millionaire, call it five millionaire, but we'll say millionaire uh, has been, it's easy to make money. It's hard to hold on to it. Right. So the average millionaire has been from a million to nothing, a million to nothing, like 10 times or something it used to be three or four times, but it's way up now. And so I never went broke, but I did lose all my cash. So I bought up, I bought this beautiful penthouse condominium this Porsche 911 with the whale tail, this brand new gray conservative Cadillac in 1989. And this house, this, I mean, this penthouse condominium on a lake, you know, was 200,000 back in the eighties when I bought it. And at that point, so I really had uh, kind of like the important thing set, but then I was completely, I'd run really low on cash. Right. And so I remember I'd have to drive to Escanaba, Michigan to play poker. I'd go there, but I didn't want to spend that much time away from my family. So I'd go there maybe Thursday and I'd drive three hours up there and I'd make three, 4,000 and come home three, four, 5,000, sometimes six, 7,000, just kind of grinding away in Escanaba, Michigan. And, you know, but from the outside, I'm in this beautiful penthouse I've donated a bunch of money to the University of Wisconsin, so I have great basketball seats, great seats for everything. And I'm the, you know, I'm in the Bascom Hill Society, which is the, the highest, you know, earner one in the, you know, the, so I gave a bunch of money when I was 24. And then, you know, and so from the outside, it looks like, wow, this is fabulous. But I'm fighting. And I fought and I fought and I fought. And, uh, you know, comes 1993 and I won three more world championships in a second. And I said, wow. Um, okay. I won the main event in 89. I won one in 92. And then I won three more in 93. I said, all right, now I'm going to become, I think that's the point where I said, I'm going to become the all time great poker player. Five bracelets coming out of 93. And now I'm up to 16. And so, you know, I think Ernest, the fun thing for me, you don't want to be the goat that has no skill. And if you look at the last year in poker, I'm the only guy that has 14 top nines in the most meaningful tournaments. I set a record last year, exactly a year ago. I made seven final tables in one World Series. No one had ever done that before. And so if you go back one between over the last year, I have three seconds at the World Series, a first. And so based on that, it seems like it seems like I'm certainly one of the best players in the world today in tournaments, but arguably number one, just based on my last year's results. And so 
you have to keep that going at age 58. You learn things like, okay, I play worse when I'm tired, you know, all these little things. And, uh, and I have to take more days off than the other guys. My weakness is blowing tournaments when I'm tired. They just play every day, 12 hours a day. But my strength is I have a knowledge base that maybe one or two people have in the world. And I'm really good at implementing it. And I'm great at reading people. Yeah. How important is it for you to retain the relevance that you have now to look at your last year and be like, still a go? Like, because I've always thought it was fascinating. Uh, let's see, we can, we were already on our music tip. So we use music as an analogy. You can have all the Grammys, all the hits, the number one songs. If you go in the club and you're, they're not playing your music anymore. Like, or you're only getting love with your throwback hits from 20 years ago. It's nothing ever compares to I am still hot right now. So yeah. like, so how important has that been to you? And how much are you considering that when you look at your legacy? I mean, look, you have a great memory of telling me this happened in 92. This happened in 99, which I'm the same way my family like makes fun of how date upset. I'll be like, hey, remember October 2003 when this happened? So like, I love how date oriented you are. Um, but like, I always... Like Kendrick has this song on his new album called uh, Count Me Out. And he's like, I love when you count me out. And he's like talking about being up late at night, you know, scrolling through the call log, nobody looking in the mirror, waiting for the fall off. Something like that, that he says. It's like, he's one of the greatest artists ever. He's proved everything, but he still is facing this doubt of like, do I still have it? And so what's the poker version of that? Well, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, the beginning of what of your soliloquy there, I want to say yes. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. You want to be show some excitement. It's not about the money. It's about staying relevant. It's about having the best record in the last year of any poker player in the world. Or arguably, I mean, maybe they could say, oh, well, this guy's slighted you out. I don't think so. but And so that's like, woo -hoo 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 -hoo, because you worked yes. your whole life for that. And to stay relevant at my age. And you look at, I've watched a million poker players fall by the wayside, you know, and, you know, and just like, they're hot and they win a bunch of stuff and then they disappear forever. And then people tell me, oh, this guy's a better player than you. This is the great young generation. None <laughs> of them are still here. And they say the next generation, oh, these guys are great. They're all gone. And the next, they're all gone. And I'm still winning, still winning, still winning. And, um, so that's a great feeling. Uh, so to, to be able to stay relevant, um, I saw I saw Drake uh, recently at the Aria and uh, and I was just happy he remembered me and gave me a hug, you know, because we'd only met once. You know, I walk up to him. He's in the high limit at the Aria and the security guard's about to jump in my face. And uh, and he's like, Phil, gives me a big hug. And I started talking to him and I said, man, it's really impressive that, you know, you've you've been on top for five years in a row he's like well actually it's six a decade <laughs> well and it's true dude, i mean he he uh you know he he says that he's i think one of his records recent he's like you know i'm, I'm 10 years in and I, and I still it's still like i'm a rookie like that's that's gotta that's gotta be great i know i i shouldn't say i know him but it's like you know i've had my run-ins with drake as well did a story back in the day we hung out at coachella and uh i i love him because for all his success, he is not really in the ivory tower like that. Maybe, maybe in terms of like the luxury that surrounds him, but that dude is like on the ground. He's, he knows everything happening on social media. He's following the memes. He's in the, you know, he'll hop in the comments and talk to people. Like I haven't, there's few superstars who I've seen like are so accessible in a way, you know, he's like, yeah, I'm right here. I'm on the pulse and I still am dropping hit records. So you know, I'm sure you and him could relate. You got you got the best celebrity stories, dude. You, you're fucking oh man, you've heard. Me. I've got. I, I'm just getting started. I mean, I've got the Tiger one, the MJ one. I was about to say Tiger Woods, Jordan, Mr. Beast. Like, like, you know, what, what's Mr. Beast like? What's Tiger like? Like, you know, I, I, I hate well, to be all name. I hate first. to be all name droppy, but like, this is the place to do it because we're not just doing it just to flex. No. We're doing it to give some insight, to learn more about the friggin' most talented people, the smartest people in the world. So, so what's people are uh, always like, Oh, Phil, you dropped too many names. That's my life. 
Tonight, where am I going? I'm sitting on the floor of the Warriors game. We play the Nuggets. I'm riding up with Joe, Lacob, and Nicole. I love riding up with them. Riding up with them is, is, is more fun than the game. And we're in the VIP everything. We go everywhere. We go to the locker room. We go wherever we want. And there's only a few people that can do that. And that's cool. But just being with them is amazing. So I'll ride up with them. And then one of the guys, Dave Friedberg from the All In Podcast, I invited him. So Joe and Nicole are like, hey, we have floor seats for you, which means I sit next to them. And then Peter Goober, who I love, this guy, like, he, you know, he was like, he was running Sony when he was 29. And he sits on the left. And these guys are just so much fun. Uh, you know, I was scheduled to go with Peter and Tony Robbins and Rob Lowe. We went to um, Machu Picchu. Then we went to Galapagos Island. Now, Tony had to bail, but we used his plane. He has this beautiful little TP on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, TR, Tony Robbins on it. Really cool. Um, but anyway, uh, where was I? I'm dropping too many names here. I <laughs> know. We're talking about so Mr. That's Beast, tonight. Tiger that's Woods. Tonight. And then, that's tonight, and then so I'll come back with the Michael Jordan story that, you know, that kind of, uh, that I tell all the young founders about the ego. Just drop it. Drop it on us. So right I'm emceeing A-Rod's event down in uh, Miami. But we're talking about it. You know, 12 years ago or something. Oh, seven, maybe a long time ago, but I am seeing it. And, um, and it's crazy. Like everybody's there. He's rented a mansion. There's five yachts behind it. And so afterwards I'm like, I want to go to the, I'm going to go to the, the, the hot nightclub in Miami mansion. So a rod's like, all right, I'll meet you there later. I'm busy. So I go over there. Um, I get out of mansion. I get out of the limo and the security is like, Phil MJ's in the back. Well, I know who f-ing MJ is. There's only one MJ. So they take me right back and plant me next to MJ in the booth, this whole of field, like all these football players. So MJ and I are standing next to each other. We're both dancing. I always joke, alpha males dance. That's a joke. Don't, don't, uh... but it's true, I think. And so, uh, and so now I look at MJ and I'm like, you're the greatest basketball. And he puts his hand up. He does not want praise. You know, he does not want praise. Praise is so corrosive. And so, you know, when your head is down, focused on what you need to do, and he worked really hard and I work really hard and Tiger works really hard. All the great ones, we work hard, but the minute you start looking up and everybody tells you how great you are, you know, you're kind of fucked because you're going to start getting off the hard work. So I keep, I say, keep your head down, not up. So anyway, I'm like, no, let me finish. And I'm like, MJ, you're the greatest basketball player of all time, but you only have six world championships. I have 11. <laughs> now that's an instant high five. He wants to be teased. You know, he yes. wants to be teased. And you and know, now, you see now, him walking up to Larry Bird doing that in the last dance. It's like, that's, and that's how you connect with these people, honestly. Like, I correct. was lucky enough to get floor seats the other night with genie bus i freaking walked in I'm, I'm like next to adam silver and i'm like okay you know i i don't get like super starstruck or anything anymore i've met a lot of people but this is you know what i mean i felt like this is kind of crazy a little genie todd bully they're all together um but i find you know not coming in so thirsty so oh my god how can we connect whatever it's just like look let's connect as people and and crack a joke yeah. or two and maybe dance and that's how you know you really build these relationships so so you tell Jordan so that you, you got 11 you, titles. Yeah. <laughs> and he just starts laughing. We high five. We just keep dancing and drinking for another two or three hours or whatever. And uh, it's just fun, you know. And, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, another MJ story I like is uh, I saw him on a Friday and I'm playing world championship events. And it's Sunday. I just finished fourth. And I tell my wife. The one place I want to eat at the Ari that won't deliver is Hobby Ears. So I have to, I'll order a phone. I have to go get my food. I said, honey, I'm going to run into MJ, which is a really weird thing to say. But this is <laughs> kind of emblematic of my life and running into people. So I went through the High Limit Lounge looking at the Ari, looking for him. I didn't see him. I asked when I got there to pick up my food, is MJ here? They said no. So I'm like, all right, whatever. So now I decide to take the, the escalator up, which is the way I'll never run into MJ. Hit the top of the stairs. Boom, there's MJ. He's walking like one step a minute with pops. One, two, three, four. They're just moving so slow. And I always walk fast in Vegas. I'm coming up fast. I slam my sunglasses on and I'm like, this, I'm not going to bother MJ. Everybody bothers MJ. So I come up 
and I look to the right and there's Pops and then there's MJ. And I'm like, hey, good to see you, MJ. He's like, hey, good to see you, Phil. And he had told me at the Kentucky Derby, you know, uh, that he's a fan of mine. And so now we're talking, now we're talking about 2012. And so, so then I'm just gone. I paid my respects. I turn the corner, boom. I go to open the VIP door right next to Carbone there, if anybody knows Aria. And I open the VIP elevator door and I look behind because I'm from, you know, from the Midwest. And so are you, you're going to open the door for somebody. It's just a polite thing to do. So we were raised. So I open the door and MJ's run to catch up with me. I'm like, holy shit. MJ ran to catch up with me. (laughs) That's a mind blowing thing. And I'm like, hey, congratulations on your wedding. And then he says, and then he's like, oh, thanks, Phil. And we talked for a while. And I just said, this is so f-ing cool, you know? And then the next day I wake up and someone's emailed me that Obama, when he was still president, is in the neighborhood. And he, um, and he was asking how I'm doing at the World Series. Book. Woo-hoo, Obama knows my name. <laughs> you know, Obama's a poker Damn. player, but I didn't know he knew me. And so now I'm so f-ing cocky. Now I, now, I, now I consider myself an asshole during that period because I'm At walking At some point, it has to go to your head a little bit. Blows you know? your mind. Yeah. And Especially so us so- little Midwest guys, man. We, we, we didn't know if this would all, you know, come this way. It would transpire this way. Like, how many of our friends never left Wisconsin, never left Illinois? So... Yeah, sometimes yeah. you gotta let it. You gotta get a little excited, like. And I, I do. Right. I hate. I hate that it's good to be humble, but I hate that jaded. You know, I, I'm too cool. It's like no, I met Michael Jordan and we had a convo. I Obama knows my name. Sometimes you just gotta relish in the moment. Right, but then if you let too much in, so I'm in the middle of the series. The next three weeks, I'm on cash number ninety nine. I can't get to a hundred. Should be easy to cash. But all I want to do is talk about Obama and MJ for three weeks. And afterwards, I'm like, Phil, you're such an asshole. What is wrong with you? You blew your mind and caught, you didn't keep your head down focused. You raised your head to look at the praise from Obama and MJ. And I just emceed Tiger's event. You know, I emcee that every year. And so it was just kind of like, in some ways, I was just really mad at myself. What's wrong with you? Uh, you know? Um, um, I know that extremely well. Look, I've never done anything, um, on your level, like globally, but I've had some successes that distracted me in life, getting caught up in them. And, and, you know, I look back a decade later, seven years later, and there's a little bit of regret in there, but you got to live with that. One of my favorite MJ things though, speaking about this, keeping your head down, working hard. I think he has a quote. I'm pretty sure, but Michael Jordan has probably the most quotes that he never said that are attributed to him. But I think this is a real one from him. Uh, he was like, you know, uh, he I, essentially, I'll paraphrase. It was like, I hate that God given talent thing. I worked for this. There was no deity that just placed all this talent in me. This was every single day grinding, working. Another one of my favorite examples, since we both are music guys, I'm just keep on dropping a little music antidotes. Lil Wayne, 2008, sells a million copies first week. The album had leaked as well. I mean, this is like only so many albums in history have done this. One of the, the Carter three, right? One of the biggest events album releases ever. The video from his documentary, his management, everybody runs to the bus. We did it. We're number one. We sold a million first week. He's like, cool i'm recording right now uh, it like great but i'm trying to work on this song i'm trying to work on the next song and that's that's really you know i think that's the key sometimes that's why you're still the man at 58 i mean i would imagine some of it just has to come from clearly you're proud of yourself as you should be but like when you're when you're there the past year that you've had how much you, are you still keeping your head down? Like you, you're not, you're not like, oh, look at my past four decades of of awesomeness. I mean, like, is that how you still stay where you're at uh, at this age? It's the ego cycle. So I was, you know, talking about, you know, how how I was just out of it for three weeks, <clears throat> not paying attention, and then the ego cycles they they lessen 
over time, you, you learn how to deal with it better. Um, you know, a, a funny story about, you know, going into last year's series is that I'd won like nine heads up matches in a row or something against the world's best players. These are televised globally during the pandemic. It really helped my brand explode. Now I finally lost one and I come back and my best friend is Chamath Palihapiti. You probably know that. Yeah, of course. And so Warty, like, Warriors minority owner, obviously all the work he did at Facebook. He's a man. I was going to ask you about him, but you're already Yeah, there. he's my bestie. And so we, <laughs> in fact, he just called me. Uh, I just hung up with him a minute ago before we started this. But he, uh, but he basically said, Phil, you've been an asshole for a couple of months. And if I just felt like a punch to the face. So first I lose to Dwan, but you understand I'd won a million and a half online. I'm winning every match. And now this is right before the series. He says, Phil, you've been unbearable. And I'm like, oh my God. So I lose to Dwan, my ego lessons. My best friend tells me you've been unbearable. I said, honey, have I been a little egotistical? Yes. So now my best friend and my, my number one core relationship, my wife are like, so I just felt smacked down and I probably went as low as I've been in a long time. How was this lucky for me? This was 10 days before the World Series started. Now I go to the World Series and I don't feel particularly special or good, you know, about myself. And I'm really just focused on the game. My head is down. And in the next 17 days, 18 days, 19 days, I made five final tables. It's never been done in the history of the World Series. So it's just crazy how, you know, how, how when the ego was way down and I wasn't feeling good about myself, that that's when the great stuff always seems to happen. And, uh, and so that's just kind of a lesson, you know, um, that when you come from a, a more humble stance, not feeling you're so great, that's when some of the best things can happen for us. What a friend and your wife to tell you that, like sometimes yeah. like people need that. I, I could have used that when I was like 26 people, need people to be honest with them and hold them accountable. So shout out to Yeah, and these mind blowing the things. Shaman. Yeah, now we'll go to Tiger. These mind blowing things just keep happening, you know? And uh, you know, yeah, let's, was, let's talk let's talk about Tiger. Obviously another go. Everybody we're talking about here is a go like the like the top best ever type. We got you, it's we just got crazy. AJ, we got Tiger. I saw I saw you and Tiger kicking it I don't know what, I honestly, I don't know what it was. I just know that you all were like, it was, it was some event. And I was like, man, like him and Tiger, are like best friends. This is, I've never seen Tiger. I don't think I've ever seen Tiger in this video that I saw with you guys together, like in a atmosphere like that, I either see him with the red shirt doing this on the, on the course or see him in a press conference all, you know, you're hanging out with the man. So, so what'd you learn from him? So, yeah, I mean, he and I have had some great talks. You know, what you don't realize about Tiger is that he, you know, most people, when he has a bad shot, he slams his club down. Well, they always tried to cut away from that on television. He cares. It's like, boom. So, I mean, he's a bit of a, a golf brat, like I'm a poker brat, right? And so, you know, and so we talked about that and refocusing and, and, and stuff like that. And, and then I've emceed his event, what, 12 years in a row, 10 years in a row now. And so that means I go into this room, we raise 1.5 million for his foundation. I have the microphone all night. So, so now we're going to April of this year and I go to, uh, I go to, I go to LA just to give my 16th world championship bracelet to Sky Dayton. Sky started Earthlink, Boingo, a flying car company. Great guy. And so, you know, David Sachs is there from the All In podcast and there's, you know, three people I can't, I'm not allowed to even mention who their names uh, that are there with us. And the, the, the you know, the, the ocean, the water's crashing, you know, and, and, uh, and we're on the Malibu, you know, at the Nobu. And, and these guys, are, you know, TikTok has just labeled me the billionaire wrangler. And so they're like, you know, every billion, I like to use the word billionaire, like, you know, every billionaire in this place are like billionaire, billionaire, billionaire. And I'm like, yeah, there's three billionaires at this table. Four, actually. And uh, so they we're all laughing. You know, every billionaire in this place and the energy is amazing. And I get my 16th world championship race at the sky. And you just the moment is just really electric. And I get tapped on the shoulder. It's Tiger. What the f 
It's Tiger Woods. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my God. I'm like, Surreal Tiger, great stuff. to see you. Right. So now, now a plan formulates in my mind. Now I could have asked him, you know, I hadn't seen him since the injury. I could have asked him about that or some other stuff. And in the past, maybe I would have, but I know he just wants to be teased. So I'm like, this is perfect. He has 15 majors and I just got my 16th. And we tease, I've been teasing him for eight years on the mic. He has more, I have more, he has more. And so I'm like, Sky, give me my bracelet. And so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna grab the bracelet, open it and say, this is what it's like to have 16 to Tiger. And he's gonna laugh and he's gonna give me a high five and it's gonna just be a really fun moment. And I pull the bracelet out and I open it and he's like, Phil, that's your 16th world championship bracelet. I knew you could do it. I'm so proud of you. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I can't, I can't tease him now. The praise was so good. My friends are like, what the fuck? And I'm like, I told you I'm every billionaire in this place, bitches. And they're all laughing, you know? And uh, so then I MC Tiger's event a month later. And that's where you saw probably the video of he and I. It's a 45 second video where he admits that he got tired. He never talks about it. I was surprised when, because, you know, I mean, he's such a strong guy, Tigers all the time. Like, yeah, my leg gave out at the Masters, and we're talking about the Masters. It's a great back and forth. And, uh, you know, when he walked in the room, though, he right away hit me. 16, huh? 16, huh? And I said, you're going to, and even in the video, I said, I'm going to hammer you on the mic. He's like, shocker. He says, shocker. So right yeah, away. I, I can tell you're a great uh, MC. Like, I'm like, bro, I'll, I'm going to hit you up when I got an event. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Uh, a, I'm not a billionaire, but I love the energy. So we'll see. I know Ben Affleck has a charity tournament coming up, um, November fourth in LA. That um, that um, I think he I think he wants me to MC that, and I'll come in and do that. Uh, I'll do that one uh, for free. Sometimes I charge, um, but I've raised seventy million dollars MCing charity poker tournaments, and I want to get to a hundred million. Um, but 70 is a great number. I'm very proud of that. Absolutely. And sometimes I charge, sometimes I don't. Uh, the Warriors charity tournament is an absolute blast. All the players have to have to play contractually. And, you know, we raised 2.1 million and that's all Nicole Lakeup, you know, and, uh, you know, Joe's wife. And uh, she's raised so much money and I have the mic all night. I know when it, when it, in that one, last time we had it and we're having it like in January, it's 10 K buy and 10 K rebuys. And there's imagine 20 tables in this beautiful room. And if they have the chance, if they own the championship, they have the Larry O'Brien trophies. So now they'll have four of them there. Right. Uh, one will be the real one and three replicas. And, uh, and there's a video screen and we have like entertainment of every kind. And I'm like, let me start by shredding the room. And I'm, Boom, I just walk over and I make fun of Joe and Nicole. And they're just, everybody's just laughing. And then Draymond walks in. I'm like, day day. And I walk over and give him a hug in the middle of my speech. Feel great to see you. Draymond is a great guy. And um, I met I met him, whatever that like little club is at the top of crypto.com. I was there for a fight a few months ago and we chopped it up for a bit. Very cool guy indeed. Yeah. And so I'm looking forward to the game. It's it's fun. It's fun. So I, I've emceed their event. 10 years or something. And we've raised 15, 20 million in that one, but it's just so much fun. And, you know, people are all in and Steph Curry is a really top poker player. It's always him and Draymond are the last two players standing. And those guys will rebuy 10,000 of their own money in the tournament, which is great. And uh, every year I've been on Draymond to outlast Steph, outlast Steph. And I've been paying Steph. We have like a five hundred, one thousand dollar bet. Steph's been beating him. I'm like, here you go, Steph. <laughs> you know, but it's just been so much fun uh, that event. Um, and you know, when I, I when I saw them get the trophies, I watched on television. I, I had goosebumps and like was almost crying because I'm so close to them. You know, I can text Steph and Draymond and a bunch of the guys and some of the young guys have shown some interest in poker. Uh, Kaminga is just starting to play a little bit, and I'll give him a lesson. But uh, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of fun with the Warriors culture. Um, that's where I first, you know, that was like Jay-Z and I had some nice moments up there too. He was at the finals game and he loves poker. Um, Your, um, I just thought of Hove because 
you were talking about, I mean, you wound up having a whole different arc with MJ, but that whole idea of just like paying your respects, I've never, I don't think I've ever had a proper conversation with Jay-Z, but the few times I just, the first time I met him, I was a kid. I had just moved to New York City. Um, I go to this nightclub and I'm so wide eyed. I'm like, this, I swear, I said to my friend, and this is what sold me. Like, this is when I got the hell out of the Midwest. I said to my friend, this is the kind of club Jay-Z would come to. <laughs> Questlove is in there play. He drops smells like to his spirit. I'm just like, which club was on? it? Cause I, I'm, I, I've been with Jay-Z in some New York clubs. Oh, uh, it was one Oak. It was one Oak, you yeah, know, which okay. is, that's weird because I was a, a one Oak with Jay-Z one night too. He loves it. He rapped about it on Ghetto Techno. Like I, in fact, I love that group, um, that whole group. And I think, you know, they have some stuff out, obviously the Vegas some stuff out here. Yeah. I love it because if you can have a nightclub last 10, 15, like that's ridiculous. I've seen the hottest places in the world busting out with celebs who make it two years, three, four. So like, it's really impressive what that group has done. But I said to my friend, it was my first time. I feel, it's feel like it's cringe now, but like, I'm like 20 years old. I'm like, this is the type of club Jay-Z would come through. I swear on my life, that man walked past me 30 seconds later. <laughs> and I was just like, all right, this is real. I'm moving to New York. And all I did, I, I shook his hand. I said, yo, you inspired me. Thank you. And he was like, thanks, brother. And we kept it moving. I, I love stuff like that. I love not hopping in for the selfie, you know, not hopping in for the da 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 It's just like sometimes just connect with people. And what I've realized, I definitely was a little bit thirsty when I was younger because I was trying to get on every time I met somebody cool. And honestly, I'm not mad at that because it did help me out in some regards. That's why me and Drake, like, were homies because I was like, saw him somewhere. He had followed me on Twitter and I ran up security, did the same. I'm like, no, I'm Ernest. We we met on Twitter. And, and you know what I mean? And then we wind up linking up. But um, I have found in my 30s and getting a little more mature, you probably see this all the time, you run into people again. Like, you see, you know, it's organic. Like, instead of always trying to force the situation, you well, see you open somebody. Well, you the door see for them. the organic. Exactly. That's and you good. see him a few times and, th and then you're like, you're like, oh, like this is actually something like I know you I've seen you. I met you six months ago. I met you last year. And like that's that's those are the type of relationships I really enjoy building. Um, I am loving this conversation. I feel like we're, you know, it's one of those conversations that could go for hours and hours like um, but I'm not going to take up your whole day. But damn, man, I definitely could with the type of life that you've led i definitely want to close this out i have a bunch of stuff i want to ask about you personally understand a little bit more about your life okay. your perspective but i gotta ask about mr beast before we get into the life of phil a little bit more you know this this dude is oh well, i'll let you come back um no i'm fine i just turned off know, the lights all good so yeah uh, this dude mr beast is just unprecedented <laughs> the level of traction he's getting on YouTube and and then really like IRL at this point like I mean I see his restaurants and burgers and stuff everywhere I see him go to a mall and the whole thing is packed I see him go when the millions dropped and the whole theater's packed out the the way that these people respond to him like like they that is their Jay Z that is their Michael Jordan like seriously. Um, also just strategically, I love how, how good he is with thumbnails. Uh, I love some of the stunts, just having like a million cash and a clock. Like he's, he's doing something special right now. Um, I don't have a sense of like who he is beyond his persona and you do, um, I would assume. And can you tell us a little bit about it and maybe like, you know, a story or a lesson? Like I always love on this this pod to hear the cool story but also understand like what you might have got out of this proximity to a really special person so what's up with that guy he's super special and um i mean super special and i was filming a poker show in vegas on a you know friday night ted cruz was there also and i'm not particularly democrat or republican um i probably probably watching the debates i probably was you know, against Ted Cruz a little bit. I found him to be a super nice guy. He had his wife and kids there because Mr. Beast was there. But let's not get into politics. I'm not a political person. Um, <clears throat> and so, but 
but Mr. Beast has scheduled the film with us. And so is, you know, chess girl, uh, Andrea Botez. And so I, I tease her. And so, uh, and so he shows up and goes broke the first hand. And I said, why don't you hang out for a while? And so he sat at the table and it was just a pleasure to have him there. And then afterwards there were some private cash games and I'm playing, uh, with Ted, you know, small, but just fun. And then, uh, you know, I, I think, it, you know, a lot of the presidential candidates uh, play poker. And so and then I was scheduled to play with uh, one of the Democratic candidates uh, later. But anyway, uh, Mr. Beast is like, hey, Phil, I want to play you heads up. I'm like, OK, let's go. So we go to the high limit room and we just start talking. And I'm trying to help the world and inspire the world. I, I first time I realized that I'm inspirational was oh one or oh two. When someone came up to me and they said, Phil, I was having a stroke and my eyes were completely closed and I survived by imagining playing you heads up. I swear to God, this guy walks in when I'm playing heads up for a bracelet and my wife said I won 13 hands in a row. And I'm just like I, this energy, I don't quite understand. But at that point, I realized, wow, I, I'm, I can be inspirational. And so, you know, that's why I put this book out, Positivity, and I think I'm going to change a lot of people's lives. It's 70 minutes to read this book. One of the life tips that's real simple, write down your 2022 goals and tape them to your bathroom mirror. That's one of the chapters. That's simple. Anyway, Mr. Beast, I instantly found out that just he and I just connect. We both want to help the planet. We both want to help the world. We're both just really good, pure people. And I'm proud that I'm a pure person. Um, people are like, oh, you're not pure. You whine at the table. Okay, I want at the table. That doesn't have anything to do with with being pure. That doesn't have to, anything to do with not cheating on your wife in thirty three years, ever. You know that doesn't have anything to do with the person I am and my beliefs. But anyway, um, so Mr. Beast and I are just completely aligned, and I'm like, this is the coolest guy I've ever met. He's twenty three, and so we're playing, and he beats me. Gets lucky, gets lucky, gets lucky. I'm down fifty thousand. Five matches at ten thousand each. And I say, I have to quit. No professional poker player is going to quit Mr. Beast. <laughs> no one. You know, and I'm like, listen, you're a great guy. And uh, I've really enjoyed being with you. And you're going to do great things for the planet. I'm so, I'm so happy that you're out there leading the charge for all these kids and setting such a great example. There's nothing but love. And I said, but I have 24 relatives in town. It's two in the morning. And I have to get up and hang out with my family for two days. So he says, all right, I'm leaving town, but he wants to keep playing. He calls me Sunday and I decided I have a, a, a like a two or four hundred thousand dollar match on Tuesday. I decided I'm not going to play, but it's Mr. Beast and I can't find anybody else to play with him. So I show up with another famous guy, Tom Dwan, who I'm going to play with. So we have our game. I won 42 of my money back. And then Mr. Beast wanted to meet Chamath. And he wanted to meet Elon. And I said, I can make those introductions. And so I said, but we're going to have our home game. Why don't you fly in? He'd already flown back to North Carolina. He flies in like Wednesday night. I go to the airport to pick him up. And he comes and stays at my house for a couple of days. We're playing heads up at my table. He beats me again. I'm supposed to be the best heads up <laughs> no limit holding player in the world. Wow. But he's just so much fun. He's just just great to be with. He's unpredictable. And uh, and then so, what he, does he say to you when he's beating like the best poker player in the world? Like, how? Does oh, he, he wants. Realize? He wants. He's teasing me, but in the nicest possible way. Oh, Phil, how do you feel about losing that hand? Like, he wants the reaction, you know. But we have so much love, you know. And uh, my wife was impressed with him as well. And then he comes to meet our poker crew, and. Our poker crew, we have like we had Lex uh, Friedman with us yesterday, who was amazing. And we have these amazing people that are changing the world with us. Um, and they and we ask them questions about how they came up. It just it just makes you stop and listen. It's such such a great story. And that led to a lot of business opportunities for Mr. Beast with my billionaire crew. And um, and actually some of those deals have come to fruition. I can't talk about details, but uh but, but, and I warned him, I said, Mr. Beast, I said, Jimmy, I call him Jimmy, you're going to lose a lot of money in this game unless you settle down. He did not have a good night that night. I got my money back. Um, but just being with him was amazing. Um, and so, 
if ever I text him, he insta texts me back, which from one of the world's biggest people, it's pretty cool, which is why I don't bother him very often. But I'm just impressed with Jimmy and I'm impressed that he's going to change the world. You saw that thing where he got rid of all the seaweed, right? Yeah. And I'm just impressed. I've found that people, sometimes at least, people like him, other big names, right, are like the most responsive people. Like they're the ones who hit the emails and the texts right back. Um, With all these friends, like what do you think of fame? First of all, you might not be, I can't walk down the street famous, but you're famous yourself. I'm sure you can barely walk through a casino. Um, and Dude, I, and I'm then, telling you, I went to a couple store open. It, it, it feels, it's really weird. It just feels like I'm constantly mobbed. Okay, so, all right, listen, I'm six foot five and I'm wearing black and gold. So people are like, oh, that's somebody. Uh, you know? So, right. but it's weird. I mean, I go to the war. I mean, I just get, I'm getting mobbed everywhere I go. But again, they might, it might be because somebody asked somebody. But yeah, it's been crazy. And the fame stuff um, is very unnatural and can really f you up. And I've been famous. Um, my fame has grown and grown and grown as I host all these TV shows. It's kind of a weird thing. And I'm also controversial, right? Um, people, a lot of people that hated me now love me. I've converted them. Um, <clears throat> and so. Well, with your personal fame and you're hanging out with Drake, Elon, Michael Jordan, like Tiger, with literally the most famous people on earth. So you also get to get an inside look at their experience and their perspective. And like you just said, fame can mess you up. I think all we really hear about are the polls, which are fame is awesome. Being able to get all this love, all these perks, like it's wonderful, what it does for your ego, the sense of validation it gives you. Like, you know, I was just watching an interview. I don't want to say um, who it was, but they were just basically like the purpose of fame it, it, for me was the validation and the the ability to be able to like say what I want and have it heard. Um, all that aside, though. The other side of it is it's oppressive, it's suffocating, it ruined me, and I'm not famous, and I don't hang out with Elon. I, I wonder, clearly you've given some thought to this, just like, what do you think of it? What do you think about it, like, sociologically? Like, what do you, what do you think it really means? What's your opinion on fame? Yeah. It's a very unnatural thing to have people, you know, staring at you all the time. Like, when I walk through the airport. And in my vision, and I have my headphones on for a reason, because I want to move fast. Because once I stop, sometimes lines form and be picture, 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 which is okay. I'm going to stop. But if I have my headphones on, then I might not hear somebody. I'm not going to get, you know, stop. But, but it's weird. You're walking along and people are staring at you. Then you see them do a double take. That's Phil Helmuth. And then sometimes they'll say it. That's Phil Helmuth to their friends. And, you know, the other guy might say who? Or they might say, Wow. And, you know, and so it's a very unnatural state to always have people look and stare at you and then you adapt to it. And most celebrities freak out through the fame. And I had a, a real issue in about 2010 uh, where I was just so freaked out by the fame. I was down in, I was down in, you know, uh, I was down in Pebble Beach and I was just getting stopped by everybody. And I was, it was freaking me out. And I had to go to spend a week and my wife and I'm like, somebody owes me a jet. We're going to go to we're going to go to uh, uh, the place that Oprah, Oprah goes down in uh, Arizona there, Canyon Ranch. And we spent a week there and it was really good for me. And I was just so uptight. It was all nothing. It was just. And so then, but I've been the star. So they host parties around me and poker. Phil's going to, it's Phil's party. And so I've hosted so many of those parties that now I've become comfortable and I stepped into that role. And so, and what about your friends? What about your superstar friends? Like, do you do? Is there anything you can observe about how they conduct themselves in the face of, you know, all that attention? Yeah, I mean, some of my friends, the All In podcast became top twenty-five in the world. That's just our guys from the poker game talking. Now they're top twenty-five in the world, and uh, they've kind of it's they've kind of f***ed up fame a little bit. You know, uh, I don't want to go into each individual one, but I laugh at them like, dude, you really, you, that was a stupid move. You know, you understand it, you know? And so they're adjusting to fame. So I see them struggling with it. It's not that I've picked anything up from anybody else. It's rather that I've learned that um, I'm going to be in the spotlight. 
you get used to it, you adapt to it. And then, you know, I was at, at a party two nights ago at some jewelry store. I went because my wife wanted to go and, uh, and right. People want selfies and all this bullshit. Right. But then I could ask, you know, the, 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 the 15 year old and the 14 year old, Hey, you guys are well behaved. What do you do? Oh, well, I'm a plus three handicap. And so it's a matter of, you know, nobody likes somebody that talks about themselves all the time. So it's more about checking in with people, hearing their stories. And, uh, and I think that that's a very, it's, everybody wants to talk and be a person. You said it earlier. And so, you know, but I also understand the role I'm in. Right. And one of the guys is freaking out. He's like, you know, I said something to him and he ignored me. He didn't say a word back. And I'm like, honey, that was strange. He comes up to me later and he's like, I thought you were. And I'm like, okay, that explains it because people freak out around celebrities. So I've adjusted to all that. And I feel like that's a role, right? So I, I play that role well. Um, but also you don't want to expend too much energy, you know, um, always being, being consumed by that. Right. Well, how did your, uh, friends and family react? Like, you know, we're talking about fans and random people in the airport, but you know, what about the people you grew up in, in Wisconsin, where it's like, damn, Phil is wealthy now and he's famous and he's friends with a lot of powerful people. He's a billionaire wrangler. Um, and you even mentioned earlier, we never got into it, but you said like, yo, I I fell out. I I don't know if you said I fell out with my dad, but you did kind of hint at the fact that some tension arose, uh, like what early nineties when you, once you started really raking it in, but like, uh, you can address that specific father situation, but also in general, just friends and family, like how did they react to seeing your transition, your come up? It's weird. You know, a lot of people have friends, they've kept friends. And I was talking to somebody uh, a couple nights ago and they said, yeah, I still have all my friends and they help keep, they help check me. But really I don't have any of the same friends from high school, any of the same friends from college. And when I came to Northern California, I was lonely for 15 years. And part of that's ADD and, you know, part of that's ego. And so that combination of my ADD and ego maybe made it harder for people to connect with me. But also there weren't a lot of people that I wanted to connect with. And I got lucky and found Shamath and then our superstar group. And we just have, you know, and poker is just such a great way to connect. We played last night and, uh, you know, we're taking some big financial swings in the game, but it's about teasing each other. Right. And Lex is at the table with us for hours and like him talking about AI and him talking about Twitter and him talking about all these subjects and who he's going to interview next. I mean, I can tell you he's going to interview Zelensky and Kanye, but he's going to interview somebody bigger than those two. And there's only two of those in the world, but I don't want to go into specifics, but he's going to like his podcast is going to be number one in the world those few weeks where he's going to do what he's going to do. And so he's there and it's just like, and so I think there's this, um, I've created new friends and, uh, you know, Chamath is my best friend and it's a great relationship. And, uh, you know, but we can both be a little, we can both have our own issues. Our ego can be a little big or I have abandonment issues or whatever, you know, and, but it's a matter of kind of seeing through those to cut back to my father. Um, yeah, I mean, PhD, JD, and MBA. He has all these letters and I have letters too, ADHD, ADD. So I had a tough time in college and I'm the oldest of five and I'm a guy. So my father, my grandfather was a world famous heart surgeon. He won like heart surgeon of the, of the year in like 19, whatever, seventies. And so he put a lot of pressure on my dad to perform. My dad then of course, put a lot of pressure on me. And so for me to drop out of school to play poker, that was like being a drug dealer and he hated it and he fought it really hard. And so, yeah, we, we, I wouldn't say it was a falling out as much as, Hey, if you're not going to accept my profession, I'm not going to hang out with you much. And then he came to the 1989 main event to watch me play. And I won it and I bought him a new Mercedes. So check, check, check. Now we're good for life. And then I married a doctor. So got the letters in there and, you know, and uh, my dad and I have pretty much been super close since then. But yeah, there was some tension, you know, surrounding him thinking that, you know, poker players were like drug dealers. We're talking about 1987, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's nice that that uh, has a happy ending. What do you think, like, makes you the, quote, billionaire wrangler? Like, 
Like, what really is that? I, I can we can name drop. We could talk about the relationships. I, I love the Shama, the fact that like you kind of were lonely in the Bay, and then you met him, and that's evolved. And I think that's a really good point. What you said about friends and family, like sometimes, and I'm I'm learning this too, right? I mentioned my whole early 30s thing, but it honestly is like a transitional period because you're out, you're out of. We know what the tw- your 20s are. And now it's like, what is friendship? <laughs> Who? How many people did I just hang out with because we wanted to party together? You know, were we really connecting? Um, and then you find new friends and, and life goes on. All of that said, like, there is this billionaire thing. And I don't know if it's conscious. I don't know what it is. You've referenced it enough that I just have to ask specifically. Is it just because like you're a cool guy and that's how shit worked out? Or is it like, it's specific. Or, do you think there's a quality about you? Like, like what is that? I, I, I think about this for years and years and years. Why are the world's most powerful people so attracted to me? Right. And I think the charisma, right. Nice guy. That's important and authentic. Nobody's more authentic than I am. So you know what you're getting, right? So charisma kind of lets charisma and fame kind of get me in the door. Uh, the authenticness helps a lot. Being able to go deep in conversations. I don't like conversations that aren't deep. You know, when I go to, when I go to Chicago, I was in Chicago a couple of weeks ago and I asked, you know, JB Pritzker, um, you know, I said, Hey, I'm going to be in Chicago, but I have to MC this event. Can we have dinner at 5 PM? And, you know, him and his wife and I, just the three of us, you know, and there we are. And I have my jersey on with Helmuth on the back. And there's like six security guards because they both six policemen because they have to have their own. You know, he's governor of Illinois right now. Of course. And uh, but that is a good hearted, pure guy. Right. And, you know, whether you agree with his politics or not, this guy's an amazing guy. And uh, he's about to win governor of Illinois again. He's up 12 points in the polls. And I love him. I mean, so I mean, like. I don't know, but I don't ever ask him for anything ever. Um, That's another thing, uh, a a characteristic amongst my friends. We never asked to borrow money. We never asked to to do anything. I remember a very sweet thing Chamath did for me. He's like, hey, there's this hurricane coming. I'm going to send a jet for you. And I said, no, you're not. Hey, but I love you. Appreciate that. (laughs) (laughs) I can't accept that. And so there's also this thing of, you know, and then, but I think, the ability to connect with people and see what they're going through that attracts people. Right. So, you know, with JB, I'm like, I had this observation. I'm like, you know, you're up 12 points and I'm looking at signing this contract worth like $40 million. So the only way we can screw it up is by saying something stupid. And we both record, you know, hundreds of hours per, per year. And we were just laughing, you know, <laughs> I said, maybe your campaign staff should lock you in the basement because you have a 12 point <laughs> lead. He's laughing. Right. And so, but that's a connection that he can relate to, that I can relate to, that his wife can, can relate to. What's and, the $40 uh, million dollar deal? I have to ask. You can't just drop I can't, that. I can't talk about that. It's, but you know, how can I screw it up by saying something public, uh, stupid, but I don't think stupid. And so therefore I don't talk stupid, you know, but people say stuff that, completely, you know, ruins their lives. One comment. And so, yeah. but I mean, like, it's just, so I don't know the nearest I can figure out are all of those things. And then being able to talk to somebody and then all of these people are in the same position as me. We all have people tugging us on our sleeves to invest, to put money in their companies, to get time with them, to be with them. And so we're at the poker table where we can just make fun of each other. There's a hundred yes men behind every one of those guys at the table. But at this table, we're like, you're too old. You're this, you're that. And, you know, we'd probably, you know, I mean, it's, we're just having fun and teasing each other. And uh, it's just a really great atmosphere and environment. And um, so I don't know what it is. There's something there. I mean, you just explained it. Honestly, all that stuff sounds about right. And obviously you've thought about it. Um, for a long time. I know, I know yes, men can be your downfall. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, like that's when I, when I see most artists and creatives fall off, it's like, there must not be anybody checking you in the studio. There must not be anybody saying this is just, this is whack. When, when your boy told you. Same thing in you know, business. You, you, yeah. These cocky CEOs. Right. And, but, but 
if I make a bad decision as a poker player, I pay the penalty and lose a lot of money. If a CEO makes a bad decision, his buffers are supposed to protect him and then his board's supposed to protect him. And, uh, you know, and so they have levels of protection, but, but yeah, I mean, celebrities and CEOs can make really bad decisions and cost them selves and a lot of their investors, a lot of money. Well, what are you investing in? I'm sure, like you said, people are tugging at you, but clearly you found some stuff that inspired you. You have all these companies you're advising, you have lasso gear, obviously with the compression socks that took the, you know, NBA and the rest of the world by storm. But like, what, how, how do you turn this like 25, however, you know, many millions, a lot of millions in winnings into, I'm guessing, you know, a little bit more. And like, look, dude, I, I talk about money on this pod a lot and I, and I hate to be like the crass, like, let's talk about money guy, but I always want to do it with the understanding that like it, it's, it's educational and it's insightful and that a business audience like FOS can like really like gain something from it. And so, you know, you make enough money from poker that that probably could have just been like, yeah, I'm good. But I am sure that you have turned into a lot more with investments and with some decisions that you Listen, made. I'm having so What's much fun. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, like somebody came to me in 2020 and they said, hey, I'm going to do this thing called a SPAC. And I'm like, okay, I'm in for 300000 in investment money. You know, I didn't realize that if he doesn't come up with the company, I lose it all. Um, yeah. But I did realize that it was going to be tripled. So I put in three hundred. So basically they have you wire the money a few months later, the next day it's floating at 900,000, but you can't sell. You have to wait a long time. And then of all things, um, I didn't even know that I was supposed to, to be the guy, but I found the company that we took out, Rush Street Interactive. And they gave me like a million and a half bonus for that. And uh, that company was floating at billions. Unfortunately, with the stock market down where it is, maybe the company is only worth a billion right now. And then because I added so much value in that spec, uh, I came into the second spec and we took this amazing company out called Genius Sports. And they have like a duopoly on sports betting information. Genius is, you know, the NFL owns 20% of Genius, an exclusive it's NFL only the, It's only them and Sport Radar, man. They got they got right. everything. I, I, I sat down and, uh, and had a meeting with them, I don't know if I was probably last year. And, you know, they're just running through some of the capabilities they have. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And they, they made all these smart purchases, I think. And then I did. And then the next one I did. So I put 500,000 to the third spec. And that was a quantum computing company, the world's number one quantum computing company. Uh, I'm going to look that stock up. Just give me one second here to see uh, what it's at. It's IONQ. I'm not telling people to buy it or not buy it. It's at $5.13. And, uh, you know, that thing was at $35 for a minute. Uh, and so, you know, so then the, the SPACs were fun. And so now, you know, and so you put in 500 K it's worth 1.5 million. The stock doubles. Now you have 3 million. I really enjoyed that. And now I'm with another group where I'm a lot more involved in the SPAC. That's fun. Uh, the early investment stuff is fun. What can I do? I can have a founder call me and I can say, all right, I'll text Andre Iguodala, you know, to invest. I can text. Antonio Gracias, who's the lead investor in Tesla and SpaceX. I can text, you know, a hundred different people. I can contest, you know, and, and, and so I'm able to help the young investors raise money from athletes, billionaires, and a lot of high net worth individuals. That one's harder for them to get to the high net worth. It's easier when you're at a VC stage. We're trying to raise money from high, worth net, high net worth individuals. You know, and I'll go to my friend Jeff Gross, and he and I have a piece of 16 companies together right now. And so that's just kind of fun, and it's a game, you know, um, but it's a fun game, and I enjoy it, and I add value to all of those companies. Um, and then when they're ready to go for VC money, we go for VC money. And so that's been really fun for me. Um, Akash, who has this company called Genies, I put a bunch of money in at $150 million and uh, and they were they, they saw me as a wild card as a, you know, they're not calling me a, um, an advisor, but they, they wanted a wild card. And so they gave me some stock and, and that was fun. You know, that company just raised at a billion dollars. Now um, we're talking a year later and uh, that's a fun one for me. And so all these generally though, I'm involved with a lot of early stage companies or late stage companies because of SPACs.
And so what's like the best exits? You ha have you had some some crazy exits with? Uh, I some... blew an exit. Um, you know, uh, I blew one lately. Of course, I've had some exits. We did. We got out of iOvation. We sold that for seven hundred million, and that one I had a uh, uh, less than two points. Um, but still, that was a really nice payday. It was their second time they've sold, so they took cash. So that was kind of nice because they just wire the money into your account. Um, yeah, I've had uh, three nice exits, I think. And um, and then, unfortunately, I didn't sell the Rush Street Interactive. I knew, uh, not from the inside, but I knew that Fanatics was going to buy Rush Street Interactive. And it made a lot of sense for Fanatics to own a, uh, a site where they could you know push some gambling. Fanatics has such a huge base. And so I didn't sell yeah, the stuff. That's Michael money. Rubin just had to sell his stake in the Sixers and the, and the Devils. You saw that? I did not see that. Well, yeah, because uh, he said Fanatic Sports Betting is launching in January. So he just, like literally yesterday, today, the news came out that he's you know, out of the ownership. I guess that's bad news for Rush Street Interactive because that means they maybe means they bought somebody else. Um but anyway, uh, yeah, but I don't know this is all. This is not, I don't have any inside information on any of this stuff, nor would I ever want that because you know, I don't want, my life is so pure and clean. <laughs> like I'm a guy that pays all of his taxes and I'm very happy to do it. As a poker player, I'm just going to say that not everybody does it and leave it at that. But I'm like, why would I, why would I, you know, why would I ever? Why do you want the SEC or the IRS knocking at your door? Ever look, I, I, they always say Jay Z has a quote for everything: "Pay your taxes, you're hustling backwards." <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's it's a few things. I just I just had, um, oh yeah, I have just remembered. So another great Hove quote: He says, "I don't want much. I drove every car. Some nice cooked food, some nice clean draws." Like that line, though. The thing about it, like, I hate when people listen to music, any music, really, and definitely hip hop, and they just look at it like surface level. That's not Jay-Z just flexing and be like, I drove every car. It's him speaking about, like, these layers in life. And so it made me think of you because, you know, cool, you got the Porsche, you bought your dad the Mercedes, you you know, you got all these these great business I'm investments. I'm in Boeing Someone... Jets Global Express at the country where the Blue Bear still connects on a low, on a yacht. Got a triple, a triple deck, deck, but I'm young. But when you're young, what the f*** do you expect? Do you expect? Yep. That's it. That's it. Grand opening, oh, yeah. grand closing. God damn you, man. Ho, crack the can open again. Correct. Grand opening, grand closing. Open to him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> love, uh, love the sing-alongs with you uh, during this conversation. But but that line came to me, and it made me think about, look, you you probably have driven, like, every car. You're at the A-Rod party with the yachts, and, like, you know, you've seen it. You've been around the world. Um, and, and, like, that's cool. I think, I think I have a lot of conversations with people like you where it's like, you know, I'm appreciative of these things. Uh, I would say it gets boring, but it just becomes life at a point. But what is something that you've seen or done that was just, like, for everything you've seen for as much as you're like, yep, I hang around billionaires all the time. What's the thing that you were like, all right, I've seen it all, but this is insane. This blew my mind. And I can't believe these type of things, this type of wealth, these type of experiences exist in the world. There's gotta be a couple that, you know, well, are just the everyday life of Phil Helmuth, well, you know, being mind, a I mean, leaps to mind, uh, you know, the, the Italy thing I talked about earlier, but also in Cabo, one of my friends had a party in late May, his 50th birthday party. And, Who's there? He brings in Cardi B, Justin Bieber, like seven other bands. And just the whole event was just so beautiful. Like, I mean, like, you know, and I mean, if you can spend 10 million on your birthday, that's amazing. And, you know, and I'm down there in Cabo and my friend uh, has this, you know, my friend, one of my Chicago friends has this $30 million place there in Miraval or whatever. And that's where my wife and I are staying. Everybody else is staying a mile away, half a mile away. <laughs> but then we have golf carts and whatever. And uh, it's just it's just like that just kind of blows you away with the access that we have there. And some of the rock stars are uh, fans, big fans of mine, which is really kind of freaky. And so then that blows you away a little bit. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, it sounds simple, but it, it was always it's always fun to, you know, I used to go to Niners games and I'd go with Jed York and and I'd stand next to Jed during the Niners games and he's very emotional, you know, and, and he's like, 
me, but I understand the emotion. I'm the poker brat. And so I get it. And so there's that emotion and, and that, but it's just, that's just stuff. And then, you know, Hey, you want to go down to the field? Okay. Yeah. Field passes that, you know, and tonight, just tonight's one, you know, I mean, I'm going to ride up with Joe and Nicole and, and Joe will end up parking, you know, the number one spot in the whole place. We'll end up walking in where the players walk and the players will all say hello to me. I've emceed their event forever. Um, half of them are on my speed dial and I'll be on the floor and then just weird things happen. Like that's, you know, that's, you know, where I'll see somebody like Jay-Z and he's actually really happy to see me and we'll talk about poker and other stuff. And it's just, it's just a little mind blowing the, the access stuff, but that just makes it. And when Joe and Nicole and I ride up, it'll be just the three of us. Friedberg will meet us there and we'll talk the whole time, but it'll, we'll just have a blast the talking. And, and I know all the moves they made and all the, you know, it's so much fun. I just feel so connected to them, but then all the, the warriors as well. And it's just hundreds of examples of stuff like that. You know, when I go to the East Coast and I reach out to, you know, um, I can't even tell you their names. I mean, the, 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 you know, guys worth 20 billion, you know, and they want to well, hang the out secret with me. The secret society of billionaires who can't be named. You obviously like live and breathe poker. Um, you're a well-rounded dude. We're rapping Jay-Z lyrics like, you know, what? we talked about music. I, I know you were there for Depeche Mode and Talking Heads and you still rocking with, with Hove and, and Cardi B. And I get that, but I always love to understand people who are so hyper-focused on something head down, like we talked yeah. about. What are like the things outside of that? Like, like, are you like a film buff? Do you hop on and play video games? Do you, are you an art I'm dude? You got Basquiat's in the crib? I'm very comfortable with my wife. And so she and I, you know, we're lucky. Our, our sons live one mile away and one mile away. That's a huge blessing for us. And so, you know, we'll sit there at the, on the couch and she'll have her legs in my lap as we're watching television. And that's really nice for me. And it's just nice to have great friendships with people. You know, the, some of the stuff that blows you away. I, I was at a playoff game and Drake was there the first time I met him. And I see him and you know, I'm walking right in front of them. And so I slow down and I say, Hey, do you play poker? Nope. So I just turn around. I'm going to walk away, whatever. I'm not going to bother. And he's like, Oh, why did you ask? Which is a very good question. I was, you know, and so I start talk, talking and we're going back and forth. Da, 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 da. You're the best poker player. You're the, you're the best musician back and forth. And we go into the tunnel and then they throw you against the wall. And, um, you're thrown against the wall to let the players come running through and stuff's running 90 miles an hour stops. Phil Drake, Drake, Phil, how do you guys know each other? We just start laughing. It's weird, <laughs> random things that just keep happening. And I'm just like, this is so weird, you know? Um, well, that uh, like is sometimes, honestly sometimes I... close to, if not the perfect point to end on. First of all, you have the records, the longest episode of my other passion because you're a real <laughs> dude. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, bro. It's just I really you, know, have. You, you said you said you liked um having real conversations and I understand like see how you talk to all these super influential people. That's how I feel, man. Like like uh, I, I'm not in here with this like weird agenda. I, I just want to talk to you. I just want to know who you are and that goes for any guest, but it's like thank you for being so real with me. Like that's that's what this is about, dude. I hate a a canned you know, stiff interview. It's like, let's real, we're real people. Let's talk. And so um, I know one of your things, this is what positivity is about. You're always in the right place at the right time. Yep. And when I think of running through the tunnel and Drake and Steph and Elon comes up, I mean, and not even the name dropping, just also making the decision in Madison, you know, 30 some years ago, um, like, like all these moments in your life and then you look up and where you're at now. And like, I imagine people have been entertained by this conversation. They've learned a lot from it, but what is the thing that, you know, you can kind of send them home with and say, well, okay, positivity, you're in the right place at the right time. Like, I feel like all the stories you said almost kind of hone in on that. That's probably why okay. that's your thing. So, Break it down. I'll, I'll, I have the perfect ending for this. First of all, I put something on my mirror, expect great things at all times. And if I'm in proximity of the world's biggest people, they find me. It's the weirdest thing ever. 
And so I now expect that to happen. So now I'm like, oh, okay, well, there's MJ. I'm gonna, he's, we're going to hang out, you know, or whatever. But let's, uh, let's, go to, let's go to the story that I, that I hope the listeners will like. And this is from my book, Positivity. I also talk about it in my autobiography, Poker Brat, here. Um, and this is my New York Times bestselling book, which was a lifetime goal, Play Poker Like the Pros. That night I told you about, I wrote yeah. down, write a New York Times bestseller. That hit the list. I was so happy. Um, but this is the story that I like to tell to prove to people they're in the right place at the right time. You have a guy, he's at his house eating three kids, and he lays out the perfect idea for his dream sports bar. Bang, 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 bang. Eight things. And his wife and kids. And then he says, Martha, please pass the peas. That means he's done with the idea. The guy next door, three kids, lays out the perfect idea for a sports bar. Eight different things. Okay. They're both in the right place at the right time, but one of them is looking for it. So this guy decides on my way home tomorrow, I'm going to stop by my favorite sports bar. Now, when he opens that door, literally opens the door, figuratively opens the door. So literally he's opened the door and he's walked into the sports bar and he's going to ask the manager or owner, how did you do it? But the minute he's taken that step, that first step, okay, you can imagine eight other doors, literal doors appear. Maybe this guy wants to sell his sports bar. Maybe this guy gives him advice. Maybe you can see all those other doors behind that. And then maybe this, maybe one leads to potential financing for a bar. Okay. And then he opens that door and now he's talking to a banker. So both of those guys are in the right place at the right time, but you have to open your eyes and look for it and make a move and take advantage of being in the right place at the right time. Most people are there their whole lives and they don't do anything. Do something because you are at homelessness in the right place at the right time right now. Man, it's been a beautiful conversation, Phil. And I don't think we could end on any better note than that. I, I really sincerely appreciate you just like rocking with me, being such a open book. You know what I mean? Like this is... This is why I do this. Um, and and you brought it and I learned something. I think everybody who tunes into this will. And uh, congrats on on your life <laughs> and Thanks, all your success. Still rocking it at uh, at fifty eight. And uh, you know, I'll be I'll be looking and watching to see what you do next, man. Clearly for all you've done and see it seems in some ways like you're just getting started. So I wish you the best. I like to think of it like this and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. That's a wrap on another episode of my other passion. I want to thank Phil for coming out, man. That dude has some crazy stories. Like that has to be one of the best conversations we've had on this show so far. Truly a really fun experience. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And you know how we do. We'll be back next Wednesday with another awesome guest hoping another banger episode like this one was make sure you listen to the lead off in the newsroom front office sports is really you know i got a lot going on with the podcast these days and we're just getting started after talking to phil for an hour and a half i do not want to keep the tape rolling on this one i know you got places to be things to do uh, but i do appreciate the support we are many episodes in at this point. It's been quite a journey. I remember starting you know, back in July and look at us now. So we'll be back soon. I'm out.